Actually, that's interesting to talk about that because I've often asked myself, like I've asked myself, what's the positive aspect of heavy metal? Because I try to find extreme examples. What would be the positive aspect of death metal? Like what, what, what could it play as a role? And the gargoyle obviously was in my mind, but then I thought something like John the Baptist, right? Mm. He's out in the desert. He's a crazy wild man. You know, he's wearing animal skins. He's like eating honey and locusts and he's screaming, repent. Like he's just screaming out to people. Yeah. You're doing it wrong. This is falling apart. Get your act together. Oh, this is horrible. And I think that there are some moments in which heavy metal music or pop music has played that role quite well. People love when you go to the extremes. Like they love if Sam Smith goes up and dresses up with the devil and like goes up on stage. It's like if he if he did that as an actual devil in the world, then people would freak out. So you can dress up as the mythological evil, but if you try to understand evil, like, or try to enter into that, and I think that's the thing. And I don't think Kanye, for all my love of him, I don't think he's totally conscious of what of, of what's animating him. But I think that's the that's what happened with him he's like he went into that and was like well let's go all the way into that dark place if you think of like nero if you know the story of the emperor who nero who wanted to be an entertainer and the fact that nero wanted to be an entertainer was like a sign of the end of the empire for people mm. because here was the highest the highest part of the state who now wanted to become what was considered to be a kind of like the lowest like this kind of simple fame you could say Thank you for watching the Winston Marshall Show. So it is my pleasure today to speak with Quebecois, well, French Canadian, <laughs> icon maker, artist, uh, artist, uh, YouTube host, uh, host of the Symbolic World podcast, and um, one of the leaders, if not the most influential person in Orthodox Christianity. Whoa. That's, That's what I've been told. It's <laughs> okay. Jonathan Pajot. Right, Jonathan, but... it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you. And um, uh, uh, w there's so many different ways we could go over this conversation because you're infinitely interesting, as I found out in a recent trip of ours to, to Greece and, and in the various chapels and monasteries of the um, Orthodox Church. Uh, but there was one conversation we had that sparked this idea of a conversation we could have as a, a, a podcast, which is about symbolism in pop music mm -hmm. and uh, this started actually you made the point to me you, I think it was a passing point about this uh, symbol which was the hand with the rock fingers yeah. uh, which you see at all rock concerts which I s sort of assumed was the, the sign of the devil um, and uh, but you told me that's wrong it's actually a sign of repelling the devil yeah well it is a devil in the sense it's like a gargoyle you know, you have gargoyles on the outside of churches to chase away the bad things. Mm -hmm. And so this is what we, we call, technically, it's a technical term called an apotropaic symbol, which means it's a symbol that uses scary things or evil-looking things to scare off evil-looking things. And so, you know, the story goes, it's that it was Dio whose mother or whose grandmother would use this and taught of this sign, you know, like if you're, if, you, if you're afraid, you know, just ward off the devil by doing that. And he started doing it at his concerts and people picked it up and then it became this, this, uh, this symbol. But the thing is that this is the thing. So it's, a, it's actually, it's a, because it's a symbol of something scary to scare off something mm -hmm. scary, just like a gargoyle, it can also be inhabited from the other side, right? It can also be the devil. It can be the devil and the thing scaring the devil off, like two monsters facing each other. And so some people really do use it now as just like evil, you know, like this celebration of evil or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the origin of it was an apotropaic, mm -hmm. uh, apotropaic sign. You know, like when you see the, the, the Maori and they do these dances oh. where, they, where they do all these faces and like and grimacing and stuff. Yes. It's something like that. It's like a, it's, that's very similar to gargoyle. Uh, it's like I'm going to scare out the enemy, you know. So like standing up to a bear, you make yourself big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you 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 make yourself. It's more like here. It's really more like make yourself monstrous. Yeah. Okay. Well, so that's filtered into rock music, and oh, and yeah. the devil plays a big part in in rock music, and uh, all the way back to Robert Johnson, who I think is that the story of Robert Johnson is probably the archetype of rock and roll music died at the age of 27, first to join the, you know, 27 club, as they say, sold his soul at the, at the crossroads to the devil to have this talent on earth, which is a Faustian uh, uh, archetypal story. Yeah. And uh, 
that story is the, it's the bedrock and and goes all the way and then even today we have the devil still re-emerging with Sam Smith on his recent tour he's dressed up with devil horns flames coming up the stage uh, all around the stage and but it's like laced in S&M and there's a whole other context to it but so there, there's a flirting with and obviously this is just one side of pop music and, and rock music but there's a flirting with the devil which is noticeable because let's say classical artists obviously the devil's always been portrayed but usually it's portrayed with with the con the contrast of the heavenly or the divine yeah. and um and so I, I wondered what your insights were in, yeah. into the in, in the devil in in pop music so this is actually something that you could trace to other forms just so we don't limit it to pop music to be careful so that people don't think well it's just rock music is evil or whatever you know in folk music in a lot of folk traditions you have a relationship between the devil and the kind of for example the devil and the fiddle right there are all these traditions i know in in, in quebec where you know when you play the fiddle and you play the fiddle like the devil and that sometimes if you play the fiddle too too well and the dance is too intense and the devil will come and dance among the people you know, and there's always this legend of a, a young woman who dances with the devil and, and kind of dances the devil through hell and it tires him out. You know, like she's the only one who can tire him out. So the idea of the devil being related to, it has to do with, I mean, the best way to understand it that it has to do with, uh, with the passions. It's the best way to understand it, you know, because folk music and dance music and everything kind of goes down into the, into the hips. It's, it's more passionate. It's, it has something... Uh, it has something of desire. It's something that has to do with seduction. It's something that has to do with the more sexual energy. And so I think that just naturally there's a sense in which that is connected to the devil in, in Western mythology, right? The, there's a famous song, which is Devil Went Down to Georgia, uh, which is the Charlie Daniel Bands, I believe, which is a famous fiddle, yes, fiddle yeah. solo and, and exactly that, in, in, in in playing toying with the devil. Yeah. But, but it's, so it's just a kind of... You, is it as simple as people are playing around with what they consider the sins, let's say, and yeah. it's it's not is it as shallower? No, it, it it's neither shallow. It's it's all the levels it can be, mm -hmm. and so this is the problem I think when people when people look at this type of symbolism or this type of music is that they'll say, oh, you know, like you know, you, in the eighties with heavy metal is satanic and it's all satanic. It's literally satanic. People worship the devil. And if, and anybody who's interested in that kind of music knows that that's not true. It's like, well, I like, you know, Black Sabbath, mm -hmm. but I know I'm not a Satanist. Like I know that that's not something that interests me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so but it doesn't mean that it, it doesn't go all the way into that. But that at the at the most superficial level, it's exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. It's something like playing with playing with our desires, playing with sinfulness, playing with fear, playing with you know. It's something like Halloween. Like we just celebrated Halloween mm -hmm. last week, and Halloween has something to do with that. It's like I'm gonna. It's it's related to carnival, mm -hmm. okay? And the symbolism of rock and roll and of pop music is related to what we would consider the ancient carnival. You know, in the ancient world, there were there were always feasts of excess, where you know usually before Lent or before some fasting period, uh, or sometimes at the end of the year, there, there's different traditions for different cultures. You would have a, a feast of excess and a feast of upside down, where just for a few days you would dress up in garish clothing, you would wear masks, you would have kind of devilish characters, mm -hmm. you would have uh, acrobats and you know, twirling things and fire breathers and all that kind of stuff. What tradition is that? No, it's a carnival. You know what a carnival is? I know, but okay, so my understanding, and maybe this is wrong. Well, Mardi Gras, right? So we had Mardi Gras in, in the West. We had, we had several traditions in the West. There's Mardi Gras before Lent, where you'll have a carnival tradition, mm -hmm. where you'll have cross-dressing and, you know, kind of a bit of lewd behavior, a little bit of, uh, uh, you know... Uh, Juggling, but doesn't that come from voodoo tradition? And, and no, no. Where does Mardi Gras come from? No, Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras is the feast before Lent, before Ash Wednesday, right? So Ash Wednesday is when you get in the West is when you get the the, the cross of the ash from the previous uh, Palm Sunday, right? And then that starts Lent. It means it starts fasting, mm -hmm. and Carnival means the feast of of flesh. It's the feast of meat, actually. So just liturgically, what it was, it's like the last day we eat meat. 
So we get together, we cook all the meat, and then we finish the meat that we have because now we're going to fast for a, a month. Mm -hmm. But then that became associated with a more general carnival tradition, which, which includes in the Jewish tradition Purim, you know, or, you know, usually it was Bacchanalia or whatever type of uh, excess tradition of upside down and excess and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, humor, all of that. So you, I mean, you've, you've seen a Mardi Gras celebration. Like if you look at Venice or you look at where people, they dress up as clowns, they'll dress up and, you know, there'll be a little bit of sexiness. And it depends on the culture, but even in very traditional cultures, you would have uh, upside down behavior, people, you know, cross-dressing and all this kind of stuff that would happen during Mardi Gras. In Purim, for example, in the Jewish tradition, it's, there's a rabbinical tradition which says that at, at Purim, uh, you're supposed to drink enough wine and spin until you fall to the ground. That's a good way to kind of understand what, what these carnival traditions are. Mm -hmm. So you, you can understand carnival tradition as something like coming into the end, right? Coming into the edge, coming into the place where all things, where things show their exception, their upside down, their, their um, excesses, you know, and we kind of expose them for a moment because it's kind of taboo in, in, most, in most of the year. Everything's kind of, you know, we have these desires, we have these maybe little flights, these little excesses, these little moments where we're not completely, we don't totally fit whatever in our thoughts or in our desires. And then usually those traditions, what they do is they open that up for like one day or for a few days, and then they close it back down. What do you think the purpose of that is? There are several purposes. One is to, to be like a valve for, for that pressure to come out. The other one is to reveal the upside down, right? It's like saying, it's like saying, this is not the normal world. This is an, this is, this is the upside down. This is the excess, mm -hmm. right? And so we have to show it to some extent so that we can know it contrasted to what's normal. So we have a moment where it's okay to wear a mask. It's okay to 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 do you know to do things that are kind of that make no sense mm -hmm. that are absurd, and then then we go back to normal, mm -hmm. and we do that like think about how we do that fractally like we do it at different levels. So at the end of the at the end of every year, usually in most cultures, there's at least one carnival, but then usually we have weekends, right? And so weekends on weekends we don't do what's normal. We do things that are a little off from normal. We, we kind of play, or maybe we'll play games. We'll, we'll do things that are a little off. Uh, and in the evening, we do the same, mm -hmm. right? So we, we work during the day, and in the evening, we'll play cards, we'll watch a movie, we'll entertain ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, and then we start again. So Carnival is like a massive version of that. It's like this massive, let's say, citywide or you know, nationwide version of Upside Down. So Halloween, like I said, Halloween is... The, one of the last remainders of that in our culture, where it's like, on Halloween, the monsters come out. Mm -hmm. And now we see the monsters. And we see the vampires and the ghouls and the monsters and the excess and the sexy nurse or whatever, like, mm -hmm. you know. And, and then and there's a little bit of pushing the limit and showing things that, that you are usually not normal. And then, then we go back to normal. So can we see pop music in a similar way where it's we're not living in that world nonstop, but we by listening to it or in going to those kinds of concerts where the devil is on display, we're, we're doing that so, again. That's right. So the way, the, the, the most positive way to understand pop music is as something like that. Because, because it has that, it has the aesthetic of kind of like dancing with the devil, you know, a little bit of that and a little bit of dancing with the excess it, it, and, and, and participating and playing with our, with the passionate element of us, right? Play, playing with those desires, playing with that, 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 that transgression, okay? Now, of course, the danger, and this is the, I mean, in some ways the danger of our age in general, is that carnival is once a year. But the difficulty with our society is that we're basically carnival all the time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we, all our culture is now entertainment, all our art is now transgressive, mm -hmm. you know, and all our culture is, so it, it, it can, for the same aesthetic, which has a normal place in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in every society, can in some ways become a, 
a stranger marker of where the society is. Mm -hmm. So think about it like this, right? So it's like at the end of the day, you how you play some cards and maybe you have a drink, you know, and then you know, and and then you you go to bed. Mm -hmm. At the end of the, on the weekend, you'll do maybe that a little bit, and then you have carnival, and then you do it massively for like a week, and you you do it more. You dress up and you do all this stuff. So and I imagine an entire society reaching the end of something, and then now becoming a kind of clown world, a kind of a kind of carnival world. I would say it's possibly even worse than that. Yeah. In in, in that, uh, if if you take uh, two examples of the devil in, in pop music, one would be Sam Smith, as I've already stated. Who, it's a, it's a celebration. That's right. It, it's it's a it's almost a joyous indulgence. That's right. But if I if we go back to when Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones were sympathy for the devil, which I think was late sixties, mm. that song. In my interpretation of that song is actually reveres the devil as it as the devil sh as much as the devil should be revered like it takes the, the devil seriously mm -hmm. it talks about being there with the bolshevik revolution and the, the where the devil really was and so in in revering it it, it revering the devil it, it's kind of the antithesis of that the old saying the best the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing yeah. the world didn't exist whereas now with let's say Sam Smith, there's such this indulgence. It's like it's it's like no, the devil's not real. We can just enjoy in this this, this kind of satanic this imagery. satanic image. Yeah. It's like there's a change. There's a change there. That yeah, there's definitely a change, but you can see it on a scale. Like again, you, it, the best thing to do is to kind of understand it on a scale. Is to this is true of most things, by the way, culturally. Is that all things that appear in culture are 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 there in every culture, but they're just there in doses, and so the the depending on how much medicine, like how, how big the medicine is, sometimes it becomes a poison. The, the very thing that was a little healing mechanism, like a carnival, mm -hmm. it can now become a massive poison that's intoxicating our, our culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is something we're seeing. So the Rolling Stones are a good example because on the one hand, I think you're right. But on the other hand, the Rolling Stones also played with that. You know, it's like they... They did it. They had the the the, uh, the Hell's Angels. You know, they hired the Hell's Angels to be their bodyguards. And you know, I know they at some point they hired these like witches from like a witch's coven to like be there. So they were really, yeah, they were like really leaning into that darkness and that kind of dark spirit, which actually is more sincere, sincere and, and 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 worrying than anything Sam Smith's done. I would say possibly. Yeah. Well, Sam Smith now he's at the end of this process where. Like you said, in some ways, it's like now we we actually worship, but it's exposing the reality, which is something like, you know, we worship the devil, like most of the culture worships the devil, objectively, right? It's like, well, what I mean is that, is that if you have a culture, and this is actually back, by the way, this is what Anton LaVey said. So Anton LaVey, the founder of the Satanic Church in the 1960s, he said, he said, you all worship the devil, you just don't know it. He said, I'm just telling you what you already are. Mm -hmm. which is that if you worship greed and money and if you worship desire and if you worship power and if you were you're just a satanist you just don't know it mm -hmm. and so that has played in through culture to a point where obviously sam smith is is, is not sm probably not smart enough to think about it consciously but unconsciously he realizes that image of the devil is the image for us today right it is the representation of our culture more than anything else. And so it just bubbles up. It kind of becomes inevitable. People don't, don't, you know, don't even think it through, I think. It just kind of, it just kind of happens. Uh, and so I think we're going to see, who's the other one? What's his name? He had that song, Call Me By My Name, the, the, the rapper. I forget his name. Anyways, he also was playing with that. Same oh, the, is that on stage? There's the huge devil that went out into the. Is it he had he had Travis these devil Scott shoes. Or, no, he, had, he had well, Travis Scott is another one, but he had like the devil shoes. He had these like Satan shoes, and he had like human blood in the in the soles or something. And then oh, wow. he did like a video where he basically gets sodomized by the devil, pretty much. Um, and it was like okay, you know. But I think I think it's we have to. You just have to kind of understand it as. You know, th so think about it also like this this kind of hierarchy that you see, this traditional hierarchy where you have the angels above. It kind of can seem silly to people, but above you have God, and then you have these angels, and then you have the people in the world, and then you have the 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 devils, uh, and and that's we're kind of there. 
That's you're sort of describing the icon that we saw oh, in, in the, that sort it, of sounds a bit like the it icon, is similar to, it's a, the it's icon of the, the icon of the last judgment okay, yeah, yeah definitely that's part of it, it it's just a, it's just you have to understand it just like a hierarchy of beings or a hierarchy of virtues or values and so you know you hear people say things like well you know actually hell looks like it's more fun right okay but so let's say it's a hierarchy yeah and, and you uh why is it that these artists are pointing downwards towards the devils and not like if you think of like well, think of a person right so a person has a hierarchy in them and you can say you know some of not everybody believes this but let's say the highest aspect of you is something like god in you or christ in you or you know the place in which you're the pure intellect there are different ways to formulate it you know uh, and then after that you have reason and rationality and thinking and then after that you have let's say kind of emotions and personality and then you have raw desire right and the raw desire is something like at the bottom of you right it's in the feet it's in the hips it's in that those areas that's where the raw desire is so if you there's an analogy between that and the other image that i showed you which is like god above and the angels and then the humans and then the devils so when someone moves down into that passionate world that world where that which matters most is my grat my gratification my sexual gratification my gratification for power my gratification for fame my gratification for all these like kind of lower instincts that we have mm -hmm. then that ultimately the culture will move towards images that reflect that mm -hmm. it's not arbitrary it just happens it just happens on its own it's like those images are 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 real they, they're analogically related to each other do you think that's to do with the, the the secularization of society, or, or you know, so in Britain now, where it's to be a Christian is a minority, yeah, a large minority, obviously. But is 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 is, is it? It's, a, is well, that it's, the root it's of it? mostly. You have to understand it as yeah, at the end of Christianity. That's the best way to understand. It. It's the bottom of Christianity. That's so we've quite reached. Bleak. We've reached. <laughs> he's like, what am I going to do with what? that? No, but what I mean is that is that is that if you reach the bottom of Christianity then you will use images that are at the bottom of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And it'll just happen on its own. And so, I mean, think about it. Think about how, you know, in the, at the, at the, during the Renaissance and the early modern period, you know, there was this kind of frenetic thing about witches, which is like, you know, are these witches? And, you know, there's these covens and there's this the whole kind of mythology that develops around the witchcraft at that, of the early modern period. Uh, and now as we reach the bottom of Christianity, now we have people who take up that role explicitly. And so you have people who say, I'm a witch and I'm in a coven. And all my, all my sisters, we all use, you know, like menstrual blood to make potions. It's like, this is a normal thing. Right. And then, then you have Sam Smith go on stage and he's the devil. And you have like all this kind of satanic and imagery which is to just manifest where we are culturally, where that is that we're at the end, we're at the bottom of Christianity, mm -hmm. and we're in a post-Christian world, but that post-Christian world is post-Christian, it's not post-something else. And so it's using, the, it's using the bottom of Christianity to deconstruct it, mm -hmm. right? It's using the, the, the exceptions, the, 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 the lower aspects to now deconstruct the thing out of which it, it came. Is there a natural place for that, where does that go next? So once you've yeah. gone to the bottom of Christianity, is there in symbolism? The resurrection. Which, resurrection. So that's a hopeful. That's the hopeful thing. But this is the shape of a church, by the way. Like if you if you if you go visit a, a medieval church, you'll see that the shape of the church is like that. So you have the altar where you have the you know the the body of Christ, which is the place where heaven and earth meet. So it's like the the equivalent of the top of a mountain like the place where things connect and that's the place where everybody goes and everybody looks towards that point so it's the point that joins us together the reason why we're there it's all that stuff and then as you move towards the back of the church then you have uh what's called the nave where then all the people are then you have what's called the narthex which is something like a transition place an entrance usually you could talk there you know, if you've gone to a, an old church, you see that you, you come through these doors, there's like an intermediary space and that's where people would come and meet and, you know, like, you know, take off their hat or whatever. And then they would go into the church. And then on the outside, then you have the gargoyles, mm -hmm. right? And the gargoyles are the end, the bottom, 
the limit of the church. And so you could imagine that pop music and rock music is the end of Western culture, but not in like, not in a way I, I want to be careful. I, I don't want to be someone who's, who looks like I'm just being a, a moralist. This is not a, it's not a, it's not a moral question. It's a, it's a, it's an ontological question, you know? And so for example, like, or it's, so you can imagine like there, in the ancient world, there'd be different types of music, right? So you would have, let's say music that you worship with, and that would have a certain style. And it would usually be quite simple, with like with very bare tones and maybe uh, very simple melodies, you know. If you think of of ancient medieval music, that it was just kind of variation. If you listen, if you've heard like in a movie, like monks read the Psalter, for example, and they go, ah, they just do that. Mm -hmm. So that would be like the highest music in the sense that it's directed towards God. Then you might have something that's there to written to celebrate the king, and maybe it would have a little more like a little more narrative and a little more gusto. And then you keep going down, and then finally you have dance music. And that's where you have the fiddle and you've got the, these jigs and you've got this, this more, that something that's a little lower. And so it's al always existed. And that's where you'll encounter the legends of the devils in those circles. And so those, all those things kind of have their place. And, the, and it's the same in general. It's just, they just have to kind of have their place. So it's like pop music is like a massive version of that. The problem is that now, you know, now we have like the president of the United States you know, interviewing Cardi B and, and it's like, what is happening? Like, why, why is the top of the country interviewing someone who just basically is talking about her midsection all the time? Right. So what, the, how, what is happening? Like, how are these things? So this is, that's what creates a weird imbalance is that the pop stars that are basically the equivalent of the ancient fiddlers and jiggers and, you know, kind of, you know, like, shady guys that went around t t from city to city to play the to play some music and get me get drunk and then move on to, to the next the city and, now they yeah. become the highest point of culture now they're invited into the, the high spheres of culture so it's like an upside down world is the best way to understand it huh. and why do you think that why why have we got to that place what do you think that means that it's an upside down world yeah what what does that tell us about well it means that it's it just means that we've reached the end of something it, you, you reach the it's like four marshals you have to say don't take it like i'm saying it's the end of the world i'm not saying it's the end of the world i just saying you know the i don't know what it's the end of but the end of something has a has a quality it's not it's not arbitrary so how something ends well look this the, i mean elvis presley was at the white house i think he met nixon the musicians have been going to the white house as long as pop, you know, pop culture, they they've wanted well, pop culture the leaders is of that. the yeah. leaders of 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 countries have want pop cultures, and because they get to a whole new demo, other demographic That's that right. they can appeal to, and and pop stars like going to the White House. I've been to the White House because it it, it strokes your ego. Oh, I'm with you know important people here. It's, it takes a lot to turn that sort of invitation down. Uh, so, but you shouldn't turn it down. No, it's not about. It's not. It's not. I want to be careful. I'm. I, I'm sorry if I'm sounding like I'm moralizing. I really. No, no. I, I'm. But I'm. I'm trying to. I am. I'm not. I'm just saying that. So. So you could say something like. It's a big statement to say this represents the sort of time of the end, and but it has, the edge. But Let's the, say the edge. edge. Let me use the word edge if you don't like end because end end might be too like you know finality. But like we could say the edge of something, and so so you could understand why in a democracy, because power comes from the people, that you would want. To appeal to that, because you you what it does, reaching into the edge, it it increases power and and reach, right? Because it's it's closer to the the mass, you could say. And so there's a, there is probably a, a a simple clear reason why in democracies then the pop singer could become as famous as the president. But we have to understand that this is something which is not a universal reality. This, you know, in a in in most traditions and in most cultures, entertainers are the they're like the scum of the earth, like they're like the lowest form. And you see that, like if you think of if you think of like Nero, if you know the story of the emperor, who Nero, who wanted to be an entertainer, and the fact that Nero wanted to be an entertainer was like a sign of the end of the empire for people. 
because here was the highest the highest part of the state who now wanted to become what was considered to be a kind of like the lowest like this kind of simple fame you could say uh now I, I, yeah we have to like i said again we have to be careful let let's let's flip it a little bit right because I want to be careful that I'm not saying that pop music. I listen to pop music all the time. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not against pop music at all. I just we we just have to understand what it is and to be careful not to pretend that it's something that it isn't. And so, uh, I think that one of the things pop music does offer is something like a lot of access and a lot of power in the sense of reach, and that's a real thing, because listening to Monks chant in a monastery, for most people, it's boring. It's really boring. It's just not interesting. Yeah. Even though, you know, or even going to a classical concert, it's like, it's not for everybody. You know, there are certain types of attention, refined attention, which, which are not accessible for, for all. But what happens with pop music is that everything about it is to be able to appeal to the most common attention possible. I sort of see pop music. Uh, uh, I I think there's two there's two kind of um, pools of pop music. Well, this will, I'll be oversimplifying, but let yeah. me oversimplify for a moment. There's there's music that like floats like a boy with the tide, and I think Sam Smith might be that, or Harry Styles might be yeah. that, where he's not changing culture, but he is of his time. He's as he is, he's popular as he is. And he fits into a lot of the philosophical currents of the time. Mm. You know, he can wear a handbag. He's kind of new, uh, gender fluid, yeah. and and so he he's 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 up and down the time. So he's that the demographic he represents, or the people he represents, that is a lot of people that have come there naturally over the course of time, and that's how philosophy and and culture has developed. Well, culture is simply culture. And then there's a, another type of arch, artist. I would say like a Bowie character who although is similar in that he's androgynous like like a Harry Styles or more androgynous probably but I would say he's the kind of character that that changes culture but either way in both categories you they represent big swaths of people so the I can see why let's say the center let's say the president or the top of the hierarchy wants to appeal to that because he wants to people right. appear to the people to to have them on side to keep to sustain him. Yeah. No, you, it's 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 Isn't actually, it as simple as that. It is as simple as that. But it also but it's important to understand the structure and to understand why things look the way they do because it's mysterious to people why why pop music is so attracted to the devil. Like why 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 was heavy metal so like just taken up by mm -hmm. this imagery? But it has a and also there's an there's the aspect of rebellion which is part of uh, rock music and that also plays yeah. in with the image of the devil in general which is the idea that in the cosmic story the rebel is the devil and so for the the rebel that imagery becomes salient very quickly it doesn't mean that everybody will participate in it but it's not surprising that that imagery appears you know mm -hmm. just just for the same reason that you know, uh, let's say appealing to horrific images or appealing to very sexual imagery to kind of break taboos and to break rules and to transgress. So the transgressive element was there, you know, it was there in Elvis, you know, and it's there ever since that there is a an aspect of transgression in 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 rock and roll, and that transgression is stepping out of the rules. Isn't that, but stepping out of the rules? It could be the devil. Or it could be more of a classic hero's journey where it's the into the unknown. It's, yeah. the, it's the hero who goes into the territory that, that he transgresses the societal norms to go into the part of ter ter you know culture that we haven't gone yet to explore that. Yeah, that. And so, so you, that's a positive. That it, so that. that narrative it would be definitely possible and be interesting actually to to look at. So Johnny Cash is a good example of that. Johnny Cash has that narrative also in his life. You know, where he represents the character that went all the way to the edge, you know, and was like singing about killing women. And like, you know, some of his songs are quite horrific. Like if you if you don't know Johnny Cash, like some of them are pretty intense, you know, and talking about murder and talking about all this stuff. And like really and also, you know, you know, obviously taking drugs and, you know, becoming a womanizer and just kind of falling into that world. 
and then coming out the other end, you know, and then ultimately, you know, loving his wife and becoming a man that was recognized as someone who had reached some kind of virtue. And I think Johnny Cash, especially in his later years, was recognized as someone admirable that had virtue and that had been able to kind of stay true despite all the difficulty that he went through. And then he's able to use, he's able to flip pop music, which is crazy, actually. Because you think of, you know I mean? Everybody's heard his cover of Hurt. And he flips that song. He, he turns it on his head. He mm -hmm. makes it mean the opposite of what Nine Inch Nails was, was trying to make it mean. That's amazing. And I think, I think it is, that is something that is definitely accessible within pop music. Not for everybody, but there are some people that I think will be able to, to do that, to, to kind of go in and flip it and then come out with a kind of weird double irony. And I think like that song is a good example of, of, a, of a very surprising moment where he was able to turn it, uh, yeah, to turn the, 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 the meaning of an of a almost masochistic song into a song about pathos and suffering and, you know, and anyways, that's an example. Well, then, uh, his whole life, his whole career, I mean, that song is, is the, 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 the kind of says it best. But if you think about, like you said, he was pursuing drugs and then he came out and he wrote that book about St. Paul. I don't know if you've read. He, he no, wrote, I haven't. He wrote a fictional novel about uh, Saul becoming Paul. Right, wow. And, um, and then some of those songs on the, uh, the American series, uh, I think he did five albums mm. with Rick Rubin, include uh, you know, When the Man Comes Around. Yeah, that's which such is, an amazing song. That, that, it's like he went through hell oh, yeah. and came, and also his version of Hurt. Yeah. He went through hell to get there, but yeah. he, he, he went to hell. He like chose to go to hell and came back on, on the other side. And that's why you, I mean, I think that that's, a char that's a, uh, an arc that you'll see in some of the characters, like some of the people, some of them burn out, you know, and like you said, they just die, like the really intense ones. And then some of them weirdly come back, like Alice Cooper and people like that, where they mm -hmm. come out and then they have a, a strange uh, brightness to them. Like, I don't know how good his music is now, but at least as a character, he's interesting because he kind of came out. Cooper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but no, well, a version of that might be what we're seeing with Kanye West. Yeah. Who, who you know, some of these songs... Uh, I thought gives... I thought Jesus King and and the last one, uh, I can't believe I don't remember his name, the name of the last one. Anyways, I thought they were amazing. I thought they were wonderful, those two albums. And, and Sunday services. And yeah. Th this is properly like, Christian music. Donda, sorry. Donda, I, yeah. I forget that. It's like, I'm a massive fan of Kanye's music. But he does that. Yeah. And then fast forward, not that long, we see him with a balaclava on, covering his face on a panel with, with Alex Jones, Jones with like two demons. Yeah, he kind of lost it. Fuentes, uh, Nick Fuentes and um, what's the other guy? Milo uh, Yiannopoulos. Yeah. Is that his surname? Um, uh, like like devils in his ears. It, 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 for me, it seemed like a, it did seem almost biblical in that you had this guy pursuing the holy who had been completely taken by devils. And, and it, it was kind of like a, a live drama. Yeah. Of... We'll see. Like I, the thing about, it's weird that we're talking about him. So the thing about Kanye, I've been a fan of Kanye since 2003. I, I, I heard his first album and I was like, this guy has something different from all the other rappers, and I've really followed his career quite attentively. And one of the problems that started to manifest them, it, itself towards before, a little bit before Jesus is King, is that he was going into extremes in the sense that he was exploring duality in its extremes. And he had that one line uh, when he, he was talking about his wife, and he would say, you're my heaven, you're my hell, you're my angel, you're my devil, or whatever. And he, and he was talking about these extremes, and and I think that that's the problem. That's his problem is that he, he's now, he just, he was like, I want to, I'm going to go to the edge of all these things. So he's like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to explore the extremes of, of everything. Mm -hmm. And some of those extremes, you know, people love when you go to the extremes, like they love if Sam Smith goes up and dresses up at the devil and like goes up on stage. But it's like, if he, if he did that as an actual devil, in the world, then people would freak out. Like someone who actually was evil, he would freak out. So you can dress up as the mythological evil, but if you if you if you try to understand evil, like or try to enter into that, and I think that's the thing. And I don't think 
like Kanye, for all my love of him, I don't think he's totally conscious of what he's, of, of what's animating him. But I think that's the, that's what happened with him. He's like, he went into that and was like, well, let's go all the way into that dark place. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I'm not hopeless for him. I don't think that he's totally lost because he, if He's, anyone can pull it back, he right. can. I'm not sure how I he hope, does I it. I hope he does considering for, for he his said own sake. You know, he loved Hitler. Obviously, things, 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 things went really far. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> one of the um, uh, things that you and I have previously talked about, but and, and touched on it here already, is androgyny in pop music. Yeah. And uh, I, I mentioned it with Sam Smith, and I, I think it probably only applies with Smith because he uses pronouns that aren't he him um and mentioned harry styles who who also uh you know wears handbag wears women's clothes is not at all scared to 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 dive into the effeminate um and then i also mentioned bowie and there's characters like prince who and bjork who kind of are these characters that um more traditional androgyny and i, I wondered why we see that yeah, in pop music again, uh, uh, quite consistently. Yeah, um, through across time. So it's 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 the power of ambiguity. It's the power of the unformed. You could say something that doesn't have specific identity. And so, as you think about a gargoyle again, right? A gargoyle is what's a gargoyle? Is it an animal? It's a it's like a lizard and with the face of a lion or whatever. It's it's mixture and confusion. And mixture and confusion is something like potentiality. It's a good way to understand it. It's not clear identity. It's not defined, right? It doesn't have clear purpose. And so think, for example, of a mosh pit, you know, where it's like no direction. Everybody's just getting pushed and shoved, and it's like this waves. That has, a, does, has, that has an ecstatic element to it, you know, because it's, it's kind of like letting yourself go to a desire, right? It kind of carries you. And, and 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 surprises you and i think that that they understand intuitively maybe not rationally that that's what they're diving into and so uh the the, the rock and roll itself is akin to that because it dives into that space that kind of space of desire and ambiguity and chaos you know it's, it's you could think about it that way it's kind of like a going down into chaos mm -hmm. um and so the the and one of the things that, so it has to do with Carnival again. So think about a freak show is a good example. So the, the freak show in traditional cultures was a kind of fascination that would remind you of what is normal, right? So you would go to the freak show to see the bearded lady, and then you'd see the bearded lady, and then you'd be like, whoa, that's crazy. That's wild. Like that's, it, and it's it's titillating. It's it, it, it kind of dives you into that ambiguity and chaos, and then you come out of it. Right, uh, and I think that that's the power of ambiguity and of andro of, of androgyny in the sense of 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 uh, kind of chaotic gender presentation. Uh, so we're attracted to it for the same reasons. Yeah, it, okay. definitely. Hmm. And it, it, and I think about, but it's the thing is that we think about it's like androgyny is part. I mean, think of Aerosmith. Think of. Iron Maiden, even Guns N' Roses, you know, it's like Axl Rose. Yeah, the hair rock band. Yeah, when we, hair, in the, very, yeah. that's right. There was a lot of that, you know, in the 80s, especially. And now it's coming back in different ways, but it's always kind of there in the. Yeah, men in, wearing lipstick, yeah. mascara. Yeah, okay. So is there like, this is, is there, is there a link to the, the Seraphin and Cherubin? So, but that's a good, there? it's a good way to think about it, is that you can think about. So we say that angels are androgynous, right? Because they don't have uh, they don't have sexual duality. So unlike saints, well, saints are yeah, saints are humans, you know. And so angels are not humans; they don't have sexual duality. They're they're androgynous. So you could so actually to to use a better term, like we could separate the terms. We could say there's androgyny above. So the idea of 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 trans of transcending gender to something which is beyond it and is not touched by it. So that would be an angel, and then there's something like hermaphrod, uh, hermaphrodite, right? The 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 hermaphroditism, which is something like ambiguous gender. It's so it's like, is it a man? Is it a woman? Would that be like Adam before 
it was Adam and Eve. So before Adam and Eve, you would have understood Adam as more androgynous, okay. as transcending gender and then being separated. Think about like it's a mountain and then at the top you got something which transcends the duality. Then you separate it into two and then it goes down. So you have male and female. And then you can imagine at the bottom of that is then the confusion of that basic duality, which is like a, a, an, a, an ambiguous part. It's like a... It's like a monster again. Like think about again the church, the way the church is made. So you have in the middle, you have the altar with the, the identity and the plates that we're moving towards. And then on the outside, you have gargoyles. And what are gargoyles? They're ambiguous beings. Mm -hmm. They're beings that you don't know if it's a lizard or a monster or a thing. Like you don't know what animal it is. It's ambiguous. And that's the same thing. So it's, 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 a, it's a demonstration of ambiguity. You know? And so if you understand, if you, if you really, if you understand it that way, you can account you can understand all the different elements of, let's say, rock music and see that, you know, the hyper male, like the kind of hyper male Metallica screaming in your face, you know, uh, guy and the ambiguous is similar because one is like on the outside, like fighting. He's a warrior. He's on the edge. He's on the he's on the he's on the edge of the world. And the other is is more like ambiguous in the sense of the place where identity breaks down and and he's not it's not clear who he is is he on this side is he on that side where, where is he uh, it can help you understand the the different aspects of symbolism that people take up so the gangster rapper who's like a gangster he's a criminal he's he's in the street and he's got a gun you know and he and he is uh, he's transgressive in that sense although you although it, it doesn't make sense to put him next to you know, uh, Sam Smith, they're, they're the same thing, just in different guises. Mm -hmm. So he's, a, he's transgressing as a criminal, he's transgressing as this and that, and he's a drug dealer, and he's a, and he's a you know, and, and then the other one is like, well, I'm ambiguous in my gender, and I, and I, you don't know who, what I am, and, and, and I, you know, and I, let's say, yeah, the, I don't know if that, if that makes sense, but. Well, why does, why does the artist, I mean, is it just a psychological or a temperamental thing? Why is, the, is it that the artist is there on, on exploring the, not just with their art, but themselves? It's not just their creation. They themselves seem to be out in this, in, in the outside of, uh, I'm trying to think really now of really boring artists who are not in the, in the, mm -hmm. in the world of the transgressive, but what, uh, or out in the, what the, the outskirts of chaos. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it that the artist is living there? Well, certain types of artists. Th there are there are types of. Th it's also because we limit what we mean by artists. So, there are types of artists that are are there to encourage uh, social order, right? So, let's say an artist who designs a garden, or an artist who designs a building, like an architect or city planner. Those are artists, mm -hmm. in the sense that they're using aesthetic means and they're using proportions and they're using relationships of colors in order to par make you participate in something mm -hmm. you know and so someone an artist who, who who makes a statue for a civic building or whatever is participating in the the cohesion of society someone who writes a an anthem or someone who you know so there are all these different possibilities and so but then you also have an aspect of human creativity which is more on the edges mm -hmm. and is more what we're talking about and so the and then the the person that moves into that space the transgressive space will be in more danger of self-destruction right these are all co these things are all coherent mm -hmm. right because he's moving into chaos he's moving into passions he's moving into ambiguity and he m might then also be moving into despair mm -hmm. because he's not connected to a clear identity and a clear purpose and so he falls into despair. He falls into excess. He gets the excess of, of, of you know, he, he, he takes too many drugs or he sleeps with too many women or he starts, it's, you know, he, he's also tempted by men and women and all these situations where, you know, wouldn't have been accessible to him before. Uh, and so the, the coherence of rock music is just because of what it's doing. And that will affect the people as much as the music, as much as the imagery. It's all, it all makes sense. So is, I was immediately thinking there of, of so you have classical musicians and, yeah. and, and obviously thousands of, of classical musicians and they aren't in that in that realm. There'll but be they, less. There'll be less of a chance. I mean, a classical musician could obviously like 
dis- fall into chaos and despair. But there, there, like the cla- there are very few classical musicians that will like walk out of the concert and they'll be like, you know, a hundred girls just throwing themselves. Yes, at but them. there are very many pop musicians. Yeah, who, by contrast, who are in that? That's realm. right. So, so what? So maybe it's it's. Well, if you appeal to desire. You know, if you if you appeal to desire and you appeal to ambiguity and you appeal you appeal to power and you appeal to all these things, then you'll attract that and you'll live in that world and you'll get the benefits of it, but you'll also get, obviously, the the dangers of it. Look, this is possibly a super tangent question, but there's one <laughs> thing from earlier that I haven't fully understood, so I yeah. kind of want to is that it's the churches with the the gargoyles yeah. all around, and and it's, I I kind of wanted to understand. Why the the builders of those churches knew to put those there? Like, because is that in scripture? It's like? the shape of the world. It really is the it's act. That's how the that's how reality works, and so it's intuitively right. So yeah, I think they probably did know how it, how it was done, but I I also think at the same time, it's the reason why they would know is because it's intuitively right. It's for the same reason that you have. You know that that you have hair on your body, right? On the outside of your body, you don't you don't have hair in your mind. You know you have the the, the dirty bits of you, and so the, it's it's a bit like, the chaotic bits of you. Is it are, like if we're in a dark room, and we're in the darkness, and we're kind of a bit more scared because we're out outside of our what we can see. Is that is that? Yeah, that's that right. Really and so you would say that in the darkness, you identity is more difficult to discern. Mm-hmm. Right, so if you move away from the light, then you are there in a position where things are unsure, and things are not clear, and so you know this is really a cosmic image, right? So the ancient Greeks, just like every single culture in the ancient world, they understood their center. Let's say we went to Delphi together, and we saw the the belly button of the world, right? We saw the umbilicus mundi, which the Greeks understood as the center of the world, right? the center of their world, but that they that's who they were. So the center of their world is the center of the world because that's where they get their identity and that's where they had their God of reason who was, you know, the, 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 the reason why they existed together. And then from that umbilicus, if you moved away, if you look at an ancient map or like Pliny, how Pliny did the map, you move away from that and then you get into stranger and stranger territory, things that you less and less understand, things that are less and less clear to you and let, until you reach a point where you don't understand what people are saying. And you don't recognize their... And, that's right. Uh, and on the edge of the world, you've got monsters and sea monsters and and ups and, and uh, the Amazons that are the upside down of Greece where the women are the warriors and, and it's all upside down, right? Because it's the, it's the, it's the limit of us. And the limit of you is your opposite. It's your upside down. It's the thing that's not you. So when they were building those churches, obviously it was intentional that they put the yeah. gargoyles there. So is, what are they trying to, apart from symbolizing the world, what are they trying to, what do we need to be reminded I of? I love how you say, apart from symbolizing the world. Well, no, what else made you that, want to do? You've already made that point, yeah. but, but what I, I guess, what you know, why, why, why even symbolize the world or, or what, what's the... Because the church is the... So the church, so you can understand it like the church is, the, is a microcosm of everything, yeah. right? And, so, and the liturgy is a microcosm of everything. And when we go to church, we're, we're, it's as if we're participating in the song of reality, mm-hmm. right? We're, we're engaging in the music of the spheres. We're basically, we're basically a, it's a tuning fork for your life. So you kind of understand how it is to live in the world. Mm-hmm. And so it will set itself up in the year, so in the year you have that cycle where you have feasts and fasts, you have carnivals, and then you have high feasts that you celebrate the important things. And then in space, you'll have the same structure. You'll have the center where you get your identity, and then you'll have the fringe where you see the exception and the amb- ambiguity and and that which is marginal, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's just how the world works. But like you asked if it's in scripture, it's definitely in scripture. Where is it in scripture? It's in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve are chased from the Garden of Eden, God puts at the gate of the garden a cherubim. But the cherub that's put at the gate of the garden is not an angel the way we think of, of cherubim. It's a monster. It's a it's a it's a like a a bull with the head of a human and the 
the front feet of a lion and the wings of a of, of an eagle. And so it's it is very much a gargoyle. And then when they made the the tabernacle, then they would put these images also on the limits between spaces, like the transition limits between identified spaces. Mm, okay, okay, and that's also why in this uh, the icon of the Last Judgment you have it then at the similar spots. Yeah. Okay, okay. So th so artists are kind of that for well, some so artists, some artists. That's right, especially right, now. Playing that role, yeah, especially now because. We, we are a society of the margin and we're a society of the of ambiguity and we're a society of upside down. And so that we celebrate the artists that participate in that. It's, it's also like, a, you know, it's a, it's a feedback loop where the artists are making it happen and then they're also elevated because they're participating in that. So it's, it, it, it kind of accelerates the process. Okay, so uh, 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 that, that sort of... Um brings us back to your earlier point about uh doom and this being the end of <laughs> <laughs> i you should have seen your eyes when i said that it's like uh, uh. <laughs> well no, i liked it earlier because there was a positive yeah um uh aspect to it and and uh, uh one we talked a lot about males all of the examples of androgyny apart from bjork yeah. i think were ma masculine what where's the role of the female in this um, yeah, well, it did not so. So, could, like female pop stars, like the famous one would be Madonna, yeah. like the pre-Madonna. Yeah. Madonna, her name is actually Madonna. Yeah. she is your desire, right? She is, she is the, she is the one you could desire without any commitment, without anything. She is just desire, and she and she gets massive amounts of power from that, and so she's, you know, she's. She's desire, but she's also that's why there's also a kind of fetishization to Madonna, right? She 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 explores S and M and all these types of aesthetics uh, because it's pure desire, right? It's not like the woman you sleep with to have a a, a child. It's like just pure desire, um, and everything about her is that. You know, I don't. If you but that's similar to like the Sam Smith using S and M. It's back to the 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 bacchanal. Back in, uh, bacchanalian sort of feast of desire and passions and, yeah. and sin it's the same sort of idea then of course is there a positive female in 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 pop music i think so i think it, it's definitely possible uh definitely those that embrace that that um aesthetic will win in terms of fame because which aesthetic the madonna the, the madonna aesthetic you know sex will always win yeah, or just just this kind of this this imagery of power and desire and like pure pure desire, you could say, uh, something that's available, just available, you know, will will win, um, because that I mean, because there's all it's important to understand like that uh, that uh, in mythological thinking, especially like kind of Christian myth mythological thinking, a whore is also ambiguous identity. Because you don't know who her child is from, right? She's a place of mixture where all the identities get mixed up. Mm -hmm. Like, like you know, because she sleeps with all the men, you know, she's not. She doesn't. Her progeny is not. Doesn't have a name. It's like it's a it's a bastard, right? Mm -hmm. And so that that makes the that character have that type of uh, have that symbolism. It's a. It really is an archetypal character. It's not just like she made that up. It's Something it's like that, the siren. The, the siren is a is a good example, especially the siren related to monstrosity. You know, because it's like the siren is pure desire, a desire that will lead you to your death, and that a desire that will not lead you to you can't have children with a siren, right? The siren will will take you in your desire to to crushing you. You know, and you you know, and so think of some of Samson the, and Delilah. Then, yeah, Samson and Delilah is also a good example of that. Yeah, especially in the story of 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 uh, Samson Delilah, because Delilah is the strange woman, right? She's she's the 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 woman that's not of your tribe, and so you know she she she's ambiguous. What's her allegiance? Is it to you? Is it to her tribe? You don't know. It's like it's a it's she has an ambiguous allegiance, and then she seduces Samson to his to his death. She takes his strength, right? She takes his strength for the for the enemy. You could say, 
So that's a good that's a good example. But if you think of like Courtney Love, like a good example is in terms of the rock and roll woman. You know, she's she's that. You know, she's that dangerous, dangerous, desirable thing that you don't want to mess with. But at the same time, you're fascinated by, and you you know you get. Um, so I, I think that that's the main that's like the main image. But you can have other. Where does someone like Taylor Swift sit in that? Because she's there's there's she obviously she's beautiful uh and but she's not she, you wouldn't say that she's sort of indulging in she's not she's definitely sin. not she's not playing she's definitely not playing uh, that role she's playing quite a down home character yeah or, or, i mean maybe she is actually down home i don't yeah. know but uh, is, is that, is that, is that, i mean i would definitely have to think of it like think of a there's another type of pop star which is the diva mm. that's a little different it doesn't seem to play as a queen. It's, yeah, it's something like it's something is like that the positive female, possibly like Adele. It's, yeah, it's, that's a, that is possibly in some ways the possibility of the 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 yeah the the one that inspires you, like the muse, maybe is a good a good way to understand the diva. I think mm -hmm. the positive aspect of the diva is something like the muse. It's something like a female voice that inspires us, you know, and they usually have a certain type of singing too like it's not exactly the same uh that that it's usually a little more inspirational and has a kind of aims up like they'll usually have more love songs or you know kind of more inspirational songs that aiming up is really interesting to me and that's something right at the beginning of this conversation we talked about because it seems that a lot of these artists in the pop world are aiming down as yeah. opposed to up and but someone like Adele it seems like she's aiming up and yes yeah. this is what more to tradition to the great artists like Michelangelo they were aiming up mm. and literally at Christ and and it seems in pop music we've we're at the stage and so I don't want to sort of hammer home the whole point that we'll, yeah on generally speaking most pop artists don't seem to be aiming up yeah. they seem to be aiming down and maybe that's well, the thing, so think about Adele too. Like think about the types of songs that we, that we get, you know? And so, and it's hard because we're so used to thinking about the, we're so used to thinking about pop, pop artists in a certain way that, culture in a certain way that we don't, we, it's hard to think outside the box. So let's say, would Adele write an anthem? And the answer is no. How right. are you defining anthem? Something that is there to celebrate something. You write something to celebrate, no. right? We don't have a lot of that because we're not, the, We Are the World was probably uh, definitely an anthem. Like there are certain songs like that that are anthem-like, which are like the, the, you know, like the equivalent of a, of a national anthem, but not necessarily, you don't have to test this that be for a na nation. It can be there for whatever, but you can have songs that are, have that kind of celebratory anthem aspect. Um, and so, but it would be interesting to think about, it. like Adele usually sings about heartbreak, you know, and, and kind of broken relationships. And it's in some That's ways a place, to, a place to cry, like someone to, to cry with, yeah. you know, and that's also a big part of pop music is like. Uh, catharsis. Yeah, catharsis for sure. Anger, uh, weeping, especially. But isn't that a, sim a similar version as well of the valve of, of yeah of the carnival just, i guess yeah. this is also what film and drama does is it allows you to have some of that catharsis cathar without actually in doing it in real life so it's easier to integrate that into your personality your yeah. psychology yeah that's a good a good example and it's a good example of how the the carnival-esque or the entertainment can play a positive role in society which is in some ways someone who is heartbroken and doesn't have a way to make it land and they don't have the capacity in them to 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 live it completely it can give them a vehicle to kind of to land into their emotion into their story uh and so definitely that's a, a quite a positive role that i think some of the the pop songs can play so back to the masculine then yeah we've mentioned harry styles we've mentioned kind of the 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 uh gangster rapper archetype it seems to me a little bit now unless like i'm having a massive brain fog on this <laughs> that we have a, a sort of very effeminate male on the one hand and there's many in that category like we've mentioned sam smith and then you have the gangster rapper types but there's not the kind of uh 
a strong the, the strong alpha alpha male who's integrated his sensitive side and his rebellious side into a positive that I think that have we have had that in the past I think Bruce Springsteen might have been that uh, in in the past but right now it doesn't seem to me that we have that sort of a character uh, do you think if I see something like that yeah, I don't do you think we sort of need I, someone like that no or well, maybe I'm <laughs> uh, maybe oh, oh. So, yeah, it's an inch, we're an interesting moment in in pop music in some ways. It feels like the carnival is running out because it's it's also it's it's odd to notice it. You know, variety is is being reduced. Like you you now you hear songs on the radio and it's like, wouldn't I just hear that like five minutes ago? There's a strange kind of homogeneity that's that's manifesting itself in in pop music. And the same with you know if you think of like the mumble rap and that kind of descent of rap into like just like such a you're just like three words repeated you know for three minutes kind of kind of thing uh it feels like everything is just breaking down into its constitutive elements really quickly and i don't i mean i'm not i'm older now so i don't obviously pay as much attention to pop music but i i don't do you see uh, anything like that seems to to be bringing it together kind of aiming well i don't know maybe this is the gap I, I, I can't possibly predict the future, but if if it if we have to send it right to the bottom of hell, maybe it seems to me that's where the gap is for someone to positive. bring. Oh yeah, I, that should that makes sense that that would happen at some point. You've mentioned Johnny Cash, yeah, but there's other sort of rabbinical types like Leonard Cohen, yeah, or, or Bob Dylan, yeah, uh, who who played a, a similar role. I agree, Bob role. Dylan for sure, and and there's sort of the priest types as well. We see them occasionally. We see them recently. People like Father John Misty. Uh, or Nathaniel Rack, uh, Rateliff, who they sort of play uh, the kind of fire and brimstone priest, and there's a, there's a preacher man mm -hmm. character that you see in in masculine yeah. front men that come. I mean, well, they're... actually, that's interesting to talk about that because I've often asked myself, like I've asked myself, what's the positive aspect of heavy metal? Because I try to find extreme examples. Like, what's de what would be the positive aspect of death metal? Like, what what, what could it play as a role? And and the gargoyle obviously was in my mind, but then I thought something like John the Baptist, right? Mm -hmm. He's out in the desert. He's a crazy wild man. You know, he's wearing animal skins. He's like eating honey and locusts and he's screaming, you know, repent. Like he's just screaming out to people. Yeah. You're doing it wrong. This is falling apart. Yeah. Get your act together. This is, oh, this is horrible. And I think that in, there are some moments in which kind of heavy metal music or pop music has played that role quite well. You know, when you think of Bruce Springsteen, it's a good example. He seems to want to incarnate that character, the character who's saying, there's people dying in the streets. This is a horrible thing happening. Yeah. And it's like, you know, we need to get our act together. Yeah. Sometimes it falls into He's politics. He's at least aiming at virtue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes it falls into politics too much, and then then you get bad songs. But think of, of, of like Bloody Sunday or like some of the best U2 songs mm -hmm. that had under them a kind of, you know, like anger at the the worst aspects of the world and just trying to kind of warn us and to or to 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 scream out in in kind of agony and frustration to see that things aren't working together that's definitely i think a very positive role that pop music can play so do you think you're happy when pol you're okay with politics and no music? i don't like when it's politics i think that if you and when it's too political i think it's wrong i think if you're able to Even frame if it's Woody it Guthrie? i think if you're able to frame it in not politics of the day but like questions of virtue or questions of of you know like let's say complaining about or finding a way to talk about corruption or to talk about excess or to talk about war in a way that is that isn't just petty but is but has a it depends some people do it well some people do it not so well but right now i don't i don't see i don't know i don't I, like i said i'm not following so much but if so it, if there's a poetry to it, it's com there, that's like right. Masters of War, like yeah. Bob Dylan, yeah. clearly about nuclear war, and, and um, as opposed to a song which would be like just like "fuck the Tories" or something like that. Which yeah, which would like, no, it would be, which would be boring anyways. You know, I mean, if, let's say think about like when when every all the all the artists hated Donald Trump or whatever. Did anybody was there? Would there be a song that would come out of that that would be any good? Well, there was a song that was massive, um, This Is America, by uh, Childish Gambino, which wasn't explicitly t 
to my memory wasn't explicitly a political, but the video invoked a lot of the stuff that was going in in America. And yeah. I mean, he it wasn't just the music; it was there was dance involved and and kind of yeah. the history of Black America. And but uh, very much one opinion, one take on yeah on that. You know, I'd say. It was but the pro- song was actually not that explicit. The song, no, you could listen to the song and 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 realize that he's talking about the difficulties of America and he's kind of naming them, but he's also, he wasn't, he didn't like, he didn't go into it too explicitly. Mm-hmm. I don't think, I mean, maybe I'm, I don't, I, I don't remember it well, uh, but I remember being impressed by that song. I thought the video was a little too easy because I, I don't totally agree with all his political opinions, yeah. you know, but I thought the song was very, was, was a strong song. So anyway, he fits the John the Baptist model. Possibly. The artist yeah. on the, on the who's side. Like, the, who's like, who's like saying, you know, like this has to change, or like you know, repent. Re- that really, that's what it, that's what it is. It's saying repent. When we talk about the problem, the idea of moving away from identity into exception, or moving away from identity into ambiguity, the role of that prophet is also standing outside, right? So the prophet is a marginal figure, in the positive sense, is that he's able to sufficiently stay out, to step outside of the of the society and the identity to not have stakes in it, to be able to criticize it. Because one of the problems of identity, you know, it's like, is that everybody in it has something to gain from it. And that's how you get corruption because everybody has something to gain for it. And so we're ready sometimes to cover over things that are unjust or or evil or whatever, to to stay connected to that center, even though that center is becoming corrupt. Mm -hmm. So you always need someone to be able to step outside to maybe be that heavy metal singer to say like, no, this is wrong. Like there's something off. There's something that's not going right. Mm-hmm. And you know, John the Baptist was killed because he he criticized the the king. And he criticized the 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 king and his and his wife and how that marriage was 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 a was immoral. And so that's that's a good example of but it's also to understand because I know I, I want to be careful always to remind people that the, the structure that I'm talking about is not a straightforward, it's not a moral structure. It's, it's like an ontological structure. It's a structure of reality. And that like the prophet is also a marginal figure in the yeah. good sense. You know? Yeah, I can appreciate that. If, if, if people are listening who are not familiar with your work, it might sound like you're being judgy of certain things and, and that I am as well. But actually knowing your work and your deep expertise of symbolism, this this stuff has been with us for not just centuries, but millennia, yeah. and and it fits into, uh, you know, very deep narratives that that it's in scripture. Uh, we've gone into a li- a little bit, and that's why that's why I was so keen to yeah. speak with you, yeah. and 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 uh, and found that so interesting. So for on, on, I think that's a positive time to finish. But it, uh, it, it, where can listeners find your work? Is it, it, where, where's the best place to find? Jonathan Pajar. So the best place people can go is to the symbolicworld.com. That's where you'll find the different activities that I'm doing. Or you can go on YouTube and just uh, look at my name, Jonathan Pajot. That's the best way to go. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thanks, it's Marshall. Absolute pleasure and an honor speaking. It's great. I loved it. Thank you for watching the Winston Marshall Show. If you enjoyed that episode, well, I encourage you to like, share, and subscribe. You can also find us on all podcast outlets if you want just the audio. And of course, on winstonmarshall.co.uk. Thanks for listening.